So definitely is recording. So that's good to know. And um, y'all see my screen, right? The the PowerPoint screen. It's all black. You see all black? Yep. Hmm. Okay, then let me change that. And we're gonna go back here and back here and welcome everybody who's joining us today. Now that's go. a nice screen. <laughs> there we go. All right, I'm gonna pop the cursor down there. So welcome everybody who's joining us. Uh, so Bob, my my off the record question is, so as you know, I go around and kill these spotted lantern flies every time I have an opportunity. Sometimes they are, how do I say this? I hope, hope nobody's eating dinner. Like sometimes the like the, squishiness stuff that comes out is like <laughs> white and i'm wondering is there a difference between what the squishy version looks like between a male and a female like i'm like oh my gosh i just killed, uh, killed a female with eggs uh i mean there's a difference of the the lantern fly i haven't observed the splatter matter <laughs> i don't know what else to call it um <laughs> after i stomp on them okay uh, but there is definitely a distinct difference uh, between like a pregnant pregnant female and a male. Uh, there'll be like yellow coloration on like their abdomen and they'll mm -hmm. be much more swollen and they'll be much larger. Much larger, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Sorry to get so graphic and detailed there. I actually <laughs> put up an Instagram post of, um, well, two things. One, I showed how you can actually capture them with the water bottle. Yeah. How they literally just pop in there. It's the coolest yep. thing. I'll, I'll, I can show that to the audience or share that with the audience uh, and mm -hmm. a follow up. But then also uh, my my it was on my fence. Like, how dare they come on my property? So <laughs> and then I, it jumped onto my lawn and then you see the splatter. So I had a little <laughs> sequence of that. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool the way the, the bottle works is like a little vacuum. Yeah, it's crazy. You don't yeah. expect it to work, but they just pop right in there. So it's yeah. very good. So, okay. So it's a little after seven. So we should, um, are we good to get started? Yeah, because we go through my stuff first and you know, yeah. then we get to the important stuff. Then we get to the important <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So we're going to get started, everybody. Welcome to, um, let's see, it's Holy Crow, September's Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes Online. I don't know how that happened, but welcome. Uh, my name is Lori Jensen. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Forestry Association, and we're really glad you're here today. Um, so without further ado, we're going to go through a little introductory. Um, so Andy, uh, let's do it. Okay, so um, yeah, we uh, will have another, hopefully another Backyard Forestry on October 21st. Um, the uh, actual um topic has not yet been determined we're looking at a couple things uh one we're looking at uh we we're just talking about today is uh carbon sequestration or whatever so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to confirm a, a speaker for that for october 21st so save the date that will be our next presentation uh, again talking about some of the things that the forestry association does in support of forest landowners you can see the list here of our newsletter website annual meeting, which uh, was online last year. Uh, not quite sure what we're going to do in 2022 yet. Uh, it's always the third Saturday of March. We don't know yet whether we're going to be able to be in person this year or not, but uh, hopefully we will. We just don't know. The Woodland Stewards Program uh, is going to be a, a hybrid pro presentation this year. Normally, it's three and a half days at Camp Lindwood McDonald up in Sussex County. This year, it's going to be next week. It'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, online from seven to nine, basically, um, three nights. And then next Saturday, uh, it will be an all day session at Linwood McDonald. It's not gonna be overnight stuff the way it normally is. It's a hybrid situation, but if you are interested in the Woodland Stewards Program and uh, learning more about uh, forest management and whatever, we will be, uh, we will be doing that. And there's been a lot of information that's gone out. You can contact um, Forestry Association and we'll, we'll uh, get information to you on that. Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes is what this is. Uh, we do represent um, uh, landowners, uh, a number of different things, stewardship, taxation, and we do have uh, legislative monitoring where we have uh, a, uh, a legislative group that does uh, follow-ups on legislation and uh, they will actually uh, help us with any kind of legislative monitoring, any kind of uh, 
evidence that we would like to present on behalf of woodland owners. So that's part of what we do as well. And Andy, before I uh, go to the next slide, I just want to mention with the Woodland Stewards Program for this year, the program is actually starting next Tuesday. <laughs> so I did put in our last email that we pretty much have to have registration done by uh, tomorrow, which is Friday, so that we can get the you know the uh, links created and sent out to everybody. So if you think you might be interested and you haven't registered yet, send me a quick email and we can either talk to you about it or uh, get you registered in time. So just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, for non-woodland owners, we have a lot of benefits as well because we are advocates for fresh air, clean water, recreation, wildlife habitat, and forestry education, which is what this is. So between the woodland stewards and the backyard forestry, uh, we do a lot of uh, education on, on healthy forests and that's for everybody, not just for woodland owners. Uh, one of the things we do uh, encourage people to do is to become a member of the Forestry Association. You can see the web site there it's $55 a year and once we get into the third quarter if you join uh, we'll cover you for the fourth quarter uh, of the current year as well as all of next year so you know for 55 bucks you're getting a year and a quarter if you were to join now so Lori you want to introduce Bob I would be delighted to introduce Bob. And before I do that, a um, couple things, those little housekeeping things that I probably should have done at the beginning. So um, feel free to stop by and say hi in the chat at any time. We, we will be monitoring that uh, briefly uh, during the presentation, uh, but we will be taking questions after. Uh, so Bob was, was kind enough to actually pre-record this presentation, but he's also here live to join us. So once the presentation is over, he's gonna uh, stick around and we'll answer uh, any of your questions, hopefully your questions. <laughs> uh, so pop them in the Q&A at any time you think of them and we'll address them when we're done. So uh, without further ado, Bob. So I'm gonna read your bio because it's really cool. Okay, I don't usually like to read it, but I just have to. So, so you are the Tri-State Territory Manager. You cover Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And as a former landscape business development manager for one of the country's largest maintenance companies, you look forward to working to each day to bringing first class customer service and knowledge uh, to your clients. That's such an awesome statement. I love that, by the way, that, you know, what the thing is, if you love your job, you're not working a day, right? So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so you have education from Penn State University and extensive industry experience in both the field and as a manager. Your hobbies consist of fishing. I'll talk to you about that later since I'll be away <laughs> doing that this weekend. Uh, fresh and salt water, watching and playing sports and enjoying a couple cold ones with friends uh, and of course tailgating. So I don't know. I don't know if I should ask this because it's probably going to cause all sorts of controversy and, and blow up the chat, but what's your favorite okay. football team? <laughs> uh, professional or yeah. college? Professional, the Eagles for sure. Of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. You can still stay on the webinar. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, and so your favorite tree is the river birch, which is an interesting choice like that. And I guess your uh, ideal thing would be if you had a, what you would like to enjoy is a dinner party with Eric Lindros, Jimmy Buffett, and Joe Paterno. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Um, and I'm going to start the recording and then we'll take questions, like I said, afterwards. So here we go. And there was one question that came up of, uh, we are recording this and the recording will be available. Absolutely, yep, thanks Andy. And let me go full screen, we're almost there people. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, Lori. I really appreciate you and the uh, group here having me out to talk today. Um, like you said, my name is Bob Dolan. I'm the Tri-State Territory Manager for Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Um, we are headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I cover the uh, following states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware uh, for us. Um, it's where I spend most of my time. I live in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Uh, graduated from Penn State um, with a degree in agricultural science. Um, been in the industry now for about eight years um, and just continue to learn every day. Um, 
a little bit about us uh, before we get too into things. We were founded in Minnesota up in the Twin Cities back in 1976. Uh, preserving elms was the main, the main objective. Um, and basically we learned how to achieve predictable results in plant health care. Um, and then down the line added pruning and removal services to our service line. Um, currently out in Minnesota, plant health care makes up about 50% of our total revenue, um, which is a lot higher than uh, the industry average. Uh, so what we do in the scientific advancements division of our company um, is we are dedicated basically to the science of plant health care. Uh, we focus on research and product development um, for specific diseases and insects um, that come into the shrub and tree care market. Um, we are dedicated to finding predictable results. We do not make any recommendations that are not backed by science. Um, so that is the core of who we are and what we're all about. Um, I mentioned a lot of research. We did uh, 155 trials in 2020, um, even with COVID. Um, we were able to navigate through that and still get a lot of new productive research trials implemented. Uh, we partner with uh, industry leaders all throughout the country uh, from coast to coast, um, including different university scientists, leading organizations within the industry, um, and different municipalities as well. As a result, this is this is the result of our research in the last you know, 45 years or so. Um, we were able to develop a really strong predictable protocol for spotted lanternfly uh, through our partnerships with Penn State, Virginia Tech, University of Delaware, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Ag, uh, we've been able to do some really good ongoing treatments uh, and research on timing, rates, active ingredients, uh, for example, uh, which has led to our industry leading management protocol that is being used by uh, different government agencies uh, where spotted lanternfly has invaded. Uh, we've also been able to implement a new label uh, to control the pest uh, through the EPA, which allows us to treat at, at higher rates. And we've even developed a new product to control it um, through tree injection called Transect Infusible. Quick little plug if anyone out there uh, may be uh, interested in getting involved um, in some tree work for a day. Uh, on September 22nd, uh, we will be having the Saluting Branches event. Um, this was kind of uh, a nonprofit organization that Rainbow started. Um, I think it was about 12 years ago at this point, um, where we're into 32 states and we, we de dedicate a day uh, of service to veteran cemeteries uh, doing tree work. So now that you guys know who I am and, and what we're all about at Rainbow, um, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this and, and start talking about some spotted lanternfly. Um, Hopefully by the time we're done this, you guys will be, be familiar with the threat that SLF pro, uh, poses, uh, be able to identify all the different life stages, understanding what different treatment options are available to, your, available to you, um, and be able to uh, recommend management options based on your, 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 your pest tolerance. Some key distinctions. Um, the biggest concern we hear about with, with spotted lanternfly is definitely from grape growers where spotted lanternfly feeding uh, has weakened those vines and has eventually led to plant mortality. Um, but as far as other hardwoods, for example, goes, that is not as much the case. Um, it's still early, but so far in the landscape, it's more of just a nuisance pest. Um, we haven't seen a ton of, of mature trees die. Um, from out, outright from spotted lanternfly feeding. Um, spotted lanternfly has very different life stages that feed on different plants throughout the year. Um, so just learning where those are and, and when they're gonna be there is, is key to the management. Uh, spotted lanternfly is spreading rapid, rapidly um, and it's super easy to move accidentally. So we'll take a look at kind of where things started and where it is now. Spotted lanternfly quarantines are in place 
uh, and measures are, are to be followed. Um, and if they're not, we're going to continue to see this spread throughout the country. Um, Transtect and Transtect Infusible are great treatment options. Um, if you want to do some nymph control, bifenthrin is, is going to be your best option as a foliar spray. Uh, and treatments should be all based on your tolerance for this pest. So what are spotted lanternfly? Spotted lanternfly are in the uh, hemoptera order. So they would be very similar to things like aphids, adelgid, scale. So they're, they're, they're piercing sucking insects. So they have a real long proboscis that's gonna penetrate through that bark and start sucking out the nutrients and sap from that tree uh, and excretes it in the form of a clear sticky substance called honeydew. So spotted lanternfly was discovered uh, in September of 2014. Um, many entomologists believe that it, it actually came in in 2012 uh, in Boyertown, Pennsylvania in a, in a granite stone yard um, where pa uh, slabs of granite were shipped in and out uh, from China and some egg masses were, were laid on the bottom side of the granite uh, where they then hatched and moved into a na neighboring wooded lot and began to feed and lay more mm -hmm. eggs and grow the population. So starting from one little site in southeastern Pennsylvania in Berks County, uh, this is our current spread of population. Um, we are now confirmed into Indiana and as of today I received a notification um, that one was found in Kansas at a fair. Uh, so it's starting to spread west, westward as well as northeast. Um, we have new populations this year in, in Connecticut, in New York, um, as well as some dead being found in Massachusetts as well. This is a, a heat map that can kind of lay out where spotted lanternfly would really thrive and where they're most likely going to be spreading towards next. Um, those deep, dark concentrations of red are really where we're, we're starting to see these populations uh, travel across throughout the United States. Uh, one of the main fears is that spotted lanternfly would reach out west into California and would begin to decimate uh, Napa Valley. Uh, those grapevines would just be under relentless pressure if they were to get out there. So what kind of damage does it do? Um, they feed on, on several agricultural crops, uh, like I said, particularly grape and apple. Um, they don't feed on the fruit specifically, but rather the branches, vines, uh, and main trunks of these, of these trees. Um, the heavy feeding weakens the plants, uh, so then they're not able to survive their winter and produce viable fruit the following year. Uh, as well as in season, the, the honeydew that is secreted from the lanternfly is then going to be laying on that fruit, creating a sooty mold on the exterior of it, uh, making it unsellable. Uh, so this has a huge economic impact as far as the agricultural industries in Pennsylvania and New Jersey go. Even in a wooded setting, we can see some pretty drastic changes happening to the landscape. Uh, these lanternfly are going to cause oozing wounds. Uh, which would then ferment um, and create a alcohol sort of odor, which then attracts ambrosia beetles. Ambrosia beetles love alcohol. They're, they they can't get enough of it. Uh, and when a tree or a plant is stressed, they secrete and release uh, alcohol smells, which draws the ambrosia beetles in and they continue to finish the tree off until it's dead. Um, and we also see understory plants and understory uh, shrubbery starting to die out because it's unable to photosynthesize. That sooty mold that starts to grow due to the honeydew that's secreted uh, basically blocks out the sun from those plants and, and eliminates their ability to create, create energy. Impact on properties. Uh, we see a huge impact on properties as far as around cars, around patios, swimming pools, um, just outdoor activities. Uh, you're going to see a huge disruption. For example, at football games, they seem to really love those hot, uh, bright lights that are above the stadium. Um, 
So anything that you would typically do outside becomes unenjoyable just because of the overwhelming populations these things can cause and the constant swarming and, and swatting that is required. It can also attract and stinging insects. So anyone who may have allergy issues to bees um, and carries an EpiPen, for example, uh, could cause a health impact. Um, so just keeping that in mind and making sure that um, anywhere where there's high traffic areas, we are, we're trying to keep that, that secretion of honeydew down. So this is where things start to get a little tricky. Uh, there's over 170 host species, I believe at this point, um, so far that have been identified. Uh, it definitely likes certain hosts at certain times of year. Um, like for example, the younger nymphs really like roses and grapes, while older nymphs like in the third and star phase, um, like black walnut, for example, uh, and tree of heaven. Whereas then when you get to the adults, they seem to prefer things more like red and silver maples. So based on the time of year, we're gonna see them at different locations. Uh, here's a list of, of, of an overall top list, I would say, uh, of their favorite plants. Tree of Heaven has long been linked and considered the key tree when it comes to managing Tree of Heaven and understanding uh, excuse me, when it comes to managing spotted lanternfly uh, and controlling it. Um, Tree of Heaven is probably the top host. If, yeah, it is the top host uh, plant for spotted lanternfly. Um, it will be there and it will be on Tree of Heaven in every life stage. So from right after egg hatch all the way through egg laying. Um, originally, we did think that it was required for the lanternfly to feed on Tree of Heaven in order to complete its life cycle and reproduce uh, to continue laying those eggs for the following season. Um, but that has been found to be untrue. Um, so we have to kind of start back from ground zero uh, when it comes to that point. Knowing the life cycle is important. It will help you know where to look for the pest. Uh, during development, it prefers different plants as I was mentioning. You can use growing degree days as a guide for its development uh, if you can't directly observe it, uh, or you can also use some other phenological indicators that you can kind of see uh, out in the landscape to determine when you should see these different phases of, of the lanternfly life cycle. Um, yep, so in May through June, that's typically when we're gonna see those eggs hatch and we're gonna see our first instar um, it's going to be really, really tiny. They're tough to find. Uh, they're really good at blending in. Uh, check for these on, on lower, lower areas, uh, on saplings, on uh, understory weeds, maybe, for example, um, and on your roses. Uh, the insect will continue to get a little bit larger through June and July, um, and it will still keep the same coloration um, as well through that June-July life stage when we're going to see it get even larger into our third instar. Um, later in that July, August timeframe, we're gonna see the fourth instar develop, which is kind of that ladybug-like coloration we're seeing down here on the bottom left. Um, those, in that life stage, they really, really tend to like walnuts for some reason. Um, so we'll start to see them move towards the woodier plants as opposed to more herbaceous tissue, like the roses, like I was mentioning, or weeds and understories. Um, or from the tree of heaven saplings. Um, around July timeframe, typically around that 4th of July, maybe even a little bit later, uh, we'll see the adults start to emerge and they'll be existing pretty much up to that first frost, hard frost or two, um, which sometimes can leave them lingering into December. So it really is a super long uh, life stage that they're present. Um, they really are only overwintering for, you know, three, four or five months. Uh, depending on, on the exact insect, um, which is really, really short period of time frame compared to other insects that we deal with in our landscape. Here we kind of just have a quick breakdown of where you're going to see these things um, in your landscape on different times of the year. 
just breaking it down into the calendar of when they're emerged. Uh, so we're kind of skipping over that egg life stage. Um, first through third instar, like I said, feeds on that herb herbaceous plant tissue uh, on the leaves and on the stems. That fourth instar, which we're seeing the ladybug coloration, we're gonna move towards the woodier plants like our tree of heaven and our walnuts. Uh, and then that late summer, early fall, we'll see those adults really feeding on our, on our woody plants and on our ornamentals. Um, and hardwood plants like our maples uh, and oaks in our landscapes. To help stop the spread, states have began to implement quarantines. Uh, the quarantine is in place for all life stages. So even egg masses have to be detected uh, and inspected for. Um, so what this means is you're not permitted to move items outside of the quarantine zone without a proper inspection. Uh, as well as a permit. Um, here's an example of, uh, of, of what a spotted land fly permit looks like um, issued by the Pennsylvania Department of Ag. Um, the New Jersey ones are slightly different. Um, so anything like nursery stock, landscape debris, household items such as like fire pits, um, fencing material like for a split rail fence, for example, um, wheelbarrows, uh, uh, tarps, lawnmowers, vehicles, campers, all of that stuff has to be inspected before it's moved from uh, one area to outside of the quarantine zone. So here's just a brief snippet of the summary kind of the main takeaway from this, this quarantine uh, implementation. Uh, the property owner shall be responsible for controlling or eliminating any life stage of the plant pest like hormone the Leculata spotted lanternfly on the property. Control procedures may include tree banding, pesticide application, removal of tree of heaven, or any combination thereof to reduce the available host of spotted lanternfly and to decrease the population of spotted lanternfly. So as property owners, as landowners, uh, we do have to kind of put our best foot forward and make sure we're doing everything we can to one, not move it, and then two, do whatever we can to help limit its ability to, to reproduce and succeed and, and live a pro prolific life um, and continue to infest different areas of our states and country. So now we'll get into uh, how we can go about stopping this, um, at least the, how we deal with it in the landscape and how the government agencies are kind of approaching things. Um, a lot of people at Penn State and the USDA and Rainbow uh, us have been conducting a lot of research um, to figure out the best methods, best timing, best active ingredients. And uh, this is just kind of a little bit of a summary of what we've been able to come up with uh, over the last 70 years or so. So Dr. Bittinger and Heather Leach from Penn State uh, have conducted spray trials and found that spotted lanternfly really are a super easy in uh, insect to kill. Um, pretty much any of your active ingredients that you can buy uh, are gonna be effective, uh, except for uh, spinosad, and excuse me here with my pronunciation of this, I'm not the best, uh, Spiro tetramat, um, were the ones that were on, the only ones non-successful. Um, so as far as contact spray goes, pretty much anything will work. Uh, the main difference is going to be um, when we start looking at residuals and how long these sprays are gonna last. Um, bifenthrin, which is probably one of your mo more common over-the-counter uh, active ingredients, uh, showed to have the best residual as far as a foliar spray goes. Uh, so that has kind of become the standard active ingredient when it comes to managing spotted lanternfly in the nymph phase. Uh, we can get up to three to four weeks of residual as opposed to others like carbaryl or many of you may be familiar with seven um, with those kind of uh, products where we're seeing about seven days of residual as opposed to three to four weeks with the bifenthrin. Here we'll look at some data that just kind of compares a couple different systemic treatments. Um, Dinotepuran is, is leaps and bounds the best uh, active ingredient when it comes to controlling spotted lanternfly. Um, 
This graph is from a trial conducted with Dr. Phil Lewis from USDA APHIS. Um, trees were treated with transect infusible at a one and a half mil rate um, per inch of trunk diameter um, or transect as a systemic bark spray, which has been the go-to method uh, throughout the industry and throughout the government agencies for combating this um, at a 12 packet uh, per gallon rate. Um, we then put tarps underneath these trees and collected the number of dead um, and then compared the number of dead insects um, as opposed to trees that were untreated um, and saw pretty, pretty awesome results. So here's just some pictures that kind of summarize it. Um, with the trunk injection formulation, we were able to get lanternfly falling dead on these tarps uh, four hours after the treatment. So we started, uh, we have, we've had lots of people ask us about using a Um I'm sure there's a lot of different mixed opinions um, on that active ingredient and on those products. Um, based on work done in Korea and by Penn State, um, imidacloprid is found to be inconsistent when it comes to efficacy. Um, surprising or not, um, imidacloprid typically has the impression in the industry that it's going to have a longer residual, uh, but for some reason it, it does not when it comes to managing spotted lanternfly. Uh, we compared multiple application methods as well, um, starting with, like, like I mentioned, that Transtech bark spray, which is dinatefurin. Um, we've also done a trunk injection with dinatefurin uh, with Imidacloprid, we did a trunk injection, so in, in injecting it directly into that root flare. And we also did a soil drench, which is probably uh, one of the more common application methods that you're familiar with. Um, the imidacloprid was much, much slower uh, when it came to uh, working and knocking down the spotted lanternfly. You can see these green and purple uh, lines here indicating that the number of dead were much lower uh, compared to uh, dinatefurin. So we reviewed the basics, background, uh, basic background of spotted lanternfly, um, the different research and the work that's been done to, to figure out what's gonna kill it. Uh, so let's kind of just bring everything together real quick and talk about different management strategies that we have available to us. So we have tree removal, uh, which we'll get into a little bit more. We have egg scraping, we have tree banding, we have foliar sprays and we have systemic options. So first we'll talk about tree removal. Um, the removal of tree of heaven, since it's one of the main host trees for spotted lanternfly, uh, eliminating that host uh, would be a great way to limit the number of lanternfly on your, that are gonna be drawn into your property. Um, a big, big, huge, huge key distinction here when removing these tree of heaven, it's imperative that you treat them with herbicide, treat those stumps with herbicide, because tree of heaven, they typically grow in groves and those groves all have a split shared root system. Uh, so what basically what that means is once you cut one, it's going to send up 10 times more sprouts of more tree of heaven than you started with. Um, so if you don't treat that stump and kill the whole root system, you're gonna end up with a bigger problem than you started with. Um, and, and with these trees being removed, typically what is done is one male tree will be left uh, standing on the property. Uh, that is because it, it doesn't have the ability to reproduce more, more sprouts and saplings. And then that one male tree will be treated with a systemic insecticide. And since it is their preferred feeding source, when those lanternflies are drawn into that tree, they will then feed on the uh, poison tree that we treated with the insecticide and die. Egg scraping, it's another uh, tool that we have at our disposal. Uh, it, I definitely wouldn't recommend it as thinking of it as a problem solver. Uh, it's a great way to, to chip away at 
the population that you could have on your property. Um, you're going to remove all of the ones that are are accessible from the ground. I don't recommend pulling out ladders and, and beginning to try to reach as high as you can to scrape them. Um, we also did some math uh, with this method. And in order to reduce the population uh, based on the number of eggs that a female spotted lanternfly can lay, um, over 90% of the egg masses would have to be scraped in order to start beginning to reduce the population uh, based on the exponential growth that the lanternfly have in their populations due to each female laying uh, multiple egg masses that have anywhere from 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. Um, and you definitely wanna scrape them and put them in some alcohol or hand sanitizer uh, to make sure that those, those uh, eggs are then unviable. Like I was saying, please don't go pulling out ladders and trying to reach to the very tippy tops of these trees. Uh, it can be pretty dangerous trying to get to them. Um, it's not a practical method when it comes, like I was saying, if you're expecting it to control your population, um, I think you're gonna be a little disappointed, uh, unfortunately. Um, as you can see here, we found egg masses way, way up in the tips, tippy tops of these, plant, or, uh, these trees. Tree bands, these are a great method to, to get you know, out there ahead of it and, and try to control the nymphs. Um, it is a good control option. It's green. It works very well against the nymphs, as I was saying, uh, as they crawl up and down these trees. Uh, the problem is that with sticky traps is that sometimes if they're not caged, um, you can catch birds or some, some bycatch. Um, I've seen squirrels stuck in them um, or some even insects that you really don't want to be, be, be catching um, that could be beneficials, for example. Um, so if you're going to use sticky traps, I, I recommend covering them uh, with a cage at a minimum, similar to this, um, just to really help avoid that bycatch. As far as using the, the sticky bands for adult control, uh, it can become a little challenging. Those adults are smarter than we think. Uh, as they start to get stuck to them, uh, they kind of just use each other and the dead ones as a bridge and kind of just march over top of them and continue to move up and down the tree. Uh, they do fill super quick when you get a high population. So changing them out every week, two weeks is imperative. Uh, otherwise, they'll start to become ineffective because all that sticky surface area will be covered up. Foliar sprays, we talked about that briefly. Um, you can ignore the rates for now. These are just different, different products that are available um, that are super effective. Uh, the rates aren't, aren't imperative. You can reach out to us um, to confirm them if, if that's something that would be helpful. Um, you can get a three to four week residual with bifenthrin. It controls the nymphs and adults. We recommend it for the nymphs so you're not having to spray your entire landscape uh, or, or, or lot. Um, with a, a broad spectrum insecticide, killing all the beneficials in the area. Um, it's great for a quick knockdown. If you're seeing a high population towards the end of the season and you wanna prevent some egg laying, uh, it's awesome just to, to knock those down real quick. Systemic treatments, Transtect and Transtect Infusible. Uh, the active ingredient is Dinotefuran. It's awesome because it can be done as a just in time treatment, or it can be done as preventative because it moves into the tree within like two to five days um, and lasts for you know four to five months, uh, four to five months um, if treating at the high rates. Um, this is what all of our government entities are using to, to treat and try to control and limit the spread of this thing. Uh, so be happy to discuss this more with you all in person um, if that would be helpful as well. Here's the transect infusible product that I was mentioning, uh, that if maybe you have trees that are, you know, really getting hit hard and they're near waterways, um, or if you don't want any environmental exposure, uh, this is a way to put insecticide directly into the tree. Um, after flowering, you'll still get awesome control and it will be out of the tree uh, by the time flowering occurs the following season. Um, so it really helps with our pollinator and, and bee issues.
So the slide's just a summary of our treatment strategy and treatment options that we have available to us throughout the entire season uh, based on the different life stage of spotted lanternfly. Uh, this is directly from our spotted lanternfly management guide, um, which we will be sending out a, a link to download that. Um, after this event, um, excuse me. Um, so yeah, we will be sending uh, a link out uh, via email and I believe even possibly physical copy uh, as well to download. Uh, here's the cover of it. Uh, feel free to check us out online. It covers pretty much everything we kind of went through today, starting with the biology of the pest, its life cycle, what it likes to feed on, the research that's been done, and even some different scenarios uh, of different properties and different property settings as well. So thank you. And we can take some questions uh, now or even at the end if you have any lingering uh, in the Q&A section, um, and we'll get into them at the end of, uh, of our talk here today. Uh, so that's all we have here for spotted lanternfly. Uh, next, we're going to get into the new disease that has hit our area, uh, beech leaf disease. So our object objectives with beech leaf disease is to review the history of it. It's, it's new, like I was saying. Uh, we'll go through its identification and description, and we'll go through the treatment protocol that is available to us uh, so far. So the history of beech leaf disease, or BLD, uh, it's a novel disease affecting American, European, Oriental, and Chinese beech trees. It was first absorbed or observed in Ohio in 2012. It has spread to counties within Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York. Um, and over the next six years, it has spread to Long Island, Rhode Island, West Virginia, Massachusetts, Virginia, New Jersey, Connecticut, and up into Canada and Ontario. Beech leaf disease symptoms have been associated uh, with a newly found and recognized nematode. Um, again, not the best with my Latin, so I'm just going to let uh, you guys do your best to determine uh, the pronunciation of that nematode there. Here's a map uh, that takes us through the, the chronological spread uh, of beech leaf disease. So the purple is going to be all the new uh, sites that were found this year. As you can see, it's kind of growing more and more rapidly uh, as time, time goes here, with the uh, first site being found just south of Lake Erie there, that little white, white area. Where is it heading? Uh, beach leaf disease appears to be uh, moving from west to east. Um, it is vectored uh, through an insect, the nematode that I was talking about just a second ago, uh, as well as avian vectors. Um, and then there's also human uh, movement of the nematode, uh, which are possible modes of its dispersal. Uh, and then there's also a likely a delay between that nematode arriving and bacteria, uh, beech leaf disease uh, being detected. So, who knows where it is at this point. We also could have much more sites uh, with it than we even realize, uh, just because we're not sure how long that delay uh, between infestation and detection is just yet. Early symptoms of beech leaf disease include uh, dark stripes or bands between those lateral veins on the foliage. Um, here we have a quick picture of it on the left, visible right at, at bud break. So right as soon as that, that leaf, those trees leaf out in the spring, uh, it's gonna be noticeable right away. The banding is definitely most apparent when you're looking at the tree uh, from the ground, right at the base of the trunk, directly upward into the canopy. Leaves with severe symptoms, they really begin to shrivel up and shrink uh, and kind of get a crinkled look. And as the season progresses, they're going to start showing signs of chlorosis, uh, really yellowing, yellowing out and getting a greenish uh, lime green hue to them. Um, they're going to start aborting bud development and have pre premature leaf drop, um, resulting year after year uh, of a thinning canopy over time, 
which in result is going to not allow that tree to have its full um, season to photosynthesize and produce the proper energy it needs uh, to become healthy and mature. Tree. tree mortality of all age classes has been observed. Uh, typically, it takes between two to six years or two to seven years. Um, six years seems to be the frequent number. Um, so six years within um, inoculation, those trees seem to be, be dying. Uh, unfortunately, there is no treatment protocol available um, as of yet. Several methods and treatment strategies are being studied. Uh, we have been making some pretty strong headway with it. Um, early research indicates that macro infusion, uh, which is going to be a form of trunk injection with uh, larger volumes of water uh, or larger volumes of solution, uh, are going to be necessary uh, to achieve high enough concentrations uh, of the proper active ingredient in the leaf tissue uh, to then kill the nematode before it's able to infect uh, our beech trees. Um, more research to be coming uh, for sure. Uh, this is definitely on a lot of people's radar. I know in Massachusetts, this is more the talk of the town than even spotted lanternfly. Um, so it definitely is something serious, uh, especially with, with, with ash trees being hit as hard as they were. Um, and now um, another, another disease that could wipe out another big, huge part of our forests. So lastly, now we'll get into oak wilt. Um, we can break down uh, this kind of section of the presentation on oak wilt uh, into diagnostics followed by the steps to take in managing the disease. Uh, it's critical to get a prompt and accurate diagnosis at the earliest possible stages with dealing with oak wilt. But with oak wilt um, delays will reduce the effectiveness of trying to implement different management strategies, and you probably would be pretty disappointed in resulting in tree mortality, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we'll go through the diagnostics, the biology of oak wilt, um, guidelines for diagnostic situations, and then just diagnosing oak wilt in general. We'll go through the management. We're gonna start with uh, macro infusion with Alamo, uh, which will be a similar uh, treatment strategy as I was mentioning with beech leaf disease. So yeah, let's get into it. Uh, oak wilt has been really, really prominent so far, um, probably for the last 15 years or so in the Midwest and in Texas, um, Texas with the live oaks. And, in the Midwest with the bur oaks, white oaks, and red oaks. Um, so this is a map of, of where it's kind of progressed to. Um, we're starting to see more and more populations in New York, as well as hearing uh, populations of it pop up right along the Delaware River in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. So I'd anticipate starting to see more red on this map uh, in the very near future. So in order to understand the management and what we're really dealing with here with oak wilt, we kind of have to understand the biology first to then understand how to diagnose it. Um, so as far as biology goes, the big thing that we need to understand is kind of what's happening to these trees when it has oak wilt enter its system. Uh, it goes through a process which is called tidalosis, which is you can think of it as compartmentalization. Basically the tree, you can think of the tree is filled with uh, tons of tiny straws that are carrying water from the root system all the way up to the crown of the tree. Uh, and basically when a pathogen enters that vascular system of a tree and the tree doesn't like it, it basically shuts down its vascular system by having uh, portions of its vascular system swell uh, to block that flow of the pathogen. So basically the tree is trying to protect itself from spreading the disease within itself. But as a result, uh, the tree then begins to kind of drown, not drown itself, to, to put itself through drought stress, to not allow itself to 
trans, trans, translocate those proper sugars and energies that it needs uh, to produce every day. Um, so oaks are typically divided into two groups, the white oak group and the red oak group. Uh, species of trees within each group react much differently uh, than others um, when it comes to oak wilt. Uh, oaks in the white oak group produce tylosis to block the movement of the fungus very quickly. Um, so transport of the sap flow through that vascular system is rerouted and plugged up. So basically that those, those white oaks are really good at shutting down that vascular system and blocking that, that oak wilt pathogen from, from moving around. Uh, that is what gives them more of an ability to withstand it and bounce back and allows us to treat more in a therapeutic way if necessary, uh, as opposed to always having to be proactive and being ahead of the game. Red oaks, on the other hand, they take hours or days for tylosis uh, to kick in. Um, so that means the pathogen, the pathogen can move throughout that tree's vascular system much, much more rapidly. Uh, so here's a result of those blocked vessels as a result of tylosis. Um, it'll really start to resemble uh, drought symptoms. This makes sense when you consider the defense strategy that the tree is you know, implementing, uh, you know, that it's plug, plugging its own, own conductive vessels. Um, you know, the water can no longer travel to the foliage in the crown. Um, so yeah, we'll start to see a lot of that bronzing. Um, things will look water soaked and begin to die from uh, tips back in towards uh, the center of that tree. Like I was saying, the leaves wilt uh, from tips and margins towards the base, turning bronze to browns. Uh, wilting leaves, they're probably gonna curl up around that midrib. Um, and then here's a picture of the staining that you'll see uh, underneath that bark, in indicating the oak wilt pathogen uh, has been moving through that vascular system. So our response in order to protect these trees, uh, like I was saying, it, it is drastically different based on which oak category they fall into. Um, red oaks succumb to the infection and die within four to six weeks of conceiving it. Um, red oaks, once they're infected, they cannot be saved. So everything has to be done preventatively. Uh, white oaks can be saved if they are found and treated uh, before they have lost about 30% of their crown. It is not uncommon to see white oaks, you know, thrive for a couple seasons uh, while struggling with oak, oak wilt uh, because of that tylosis. But once they're once they reach that 30% infection period, it, they're going to be too far gone to, to see. <clears throat> so here's a picture of the spore mat that begins to grow underneath the bark in that vascular system um, resulting in the tree dying. Uh, so here's just a picture of it under, underneath that bark for a reference. Like I was saying, the white oak family shows most resistance. Um, some trees may live indefinitely or take multiple years to succumb. Uh, individual leaf symptoms are similar to those of red oaks. But rather than complete wilting from the top down, white oaks may lose a branch or two per year uh, over an extended period of time until that tree, dry, tree dies. Um, sometimes the leaf symptoms may be more scattered throughout the canopy as opposed to you know, consistent moving its way throughout. Um, the sapwood streaking, so that staining and, and whatnot that I showed you a couple slides ago, is going to be a lot less apparent. Um, and there typically aren't spore mats like we see on the red oaks uh, like we saw in this previous picture here. So how is this oak wilt even transmitted to begin with? Um, there's two main ways and the first we'll talk about is through overland uh, insect vectors. Um, between April and late June uh, the fungus produces spore mats like we should excuse me like I had showed you on those red oaks um, and between the bark and wood, 
and then sap feeding and uh, bark feeding insects, uh, like a picnic beetle, for example, will come and feed on that tree where that spore mat is located. Um, it then picks it up and moves it to a fresh wound, a fresh pruning wound um, on a healthy tree. And then you have a new epicenter for an oak, oak wilt outbreak. Um, that is why a lot of counties or a lot of states even, um, cities, they will put in pruning restrictions for oaks. Uh, and basically you're only allowed to prune them during dormant season. And that is to help limit uh, the transmission via uh, insect vectors into open fresh uh, wounds from pruning. The main route of transmission though happens through root grafting. Uh, approximately 90% of the trees that are infected with oak wilt uh, become infected when the fungus travels from an infected tree to a healthy tree through a root graft or a common root system. Uh, the root grafts are underground connections of the vascular tissue that occur between trees of the same species uh, that grow in close proximity to each other. So you can have a red oak uh, graft to a white oak uh, it has to be the same same species of tree. Um, and you can see see these uh, spread, you know, 75 to 25 feet per year uh, based on the root system. So here's a good visual example. You can kind of see oak wilt moving right down the row uh, of these trees here. One of them received it, and then they all, since they share a root graft in, in a common root system, most likely, um, they all then received oak wilt because the trees weren't uh, protected. <clears throat> so here uh, we'll show you a the xylem layer of an oak. Uh, the staining stays in a line consistent with the sapwood vessels. Uh, you can see it right here, that black streaking uh, just going up and down. To confirm if you have, if you think you have oak, oak wilt, it is definitely best to use uh, your local disease lab or clinic. Uh, Rutgers has an awesome one. Um, select, select a symptomatic limb from your tree. Um, one and a half to two inches in diameter is typically what's recommended and at least six inches long. Um, send that leaf tissue, you know, from sampled limbs out to a lab, um, Rutgers most likely, uh, in a sealed plastic bag. Um, if you can keep it cool, that is ideal. Um, you definitely want to get it there quickly so that you know that sample can be tested as soon as possible, uh, so they can get the most accurate sample as possible. Uh, I know at Rutgers they really do like when things are shipped at the beginning of the week so that it's not sitting over a weekend uh, again, so that that tissue sample can be as viable as possible. The the ideal location would be to collect at the transition point between the live and dead portions of a branch. Um, the non-symptomatic tissue uh, and the part that is showing symptoms is really what they're looking for. Uh, if a piece of a sample has been dead for a while, um, it will not be able to tell, you know, tell us much of value. If it is dead for any length of time, um, you know, it'll be really thoroughly discolored and, and, and invaded by other decaying organisms. Uh, that are going to compromise it, and make it useless, unfortunately. Um, one common question we typically get is if we have a lab, uh, we do not have a lab. Uh, we typically refer all those to, to university um, laboratories. So now we'll get into macro infusion with Alamo. It's the second part of our management protocol, now that we know what it is uh, and how to diagnose it. So with oak well treatments, um, it's kind of the best analogy I can give. Uh, it's kind of when you put your finger over a, a straw that's in a cup of water, um, we wanna think of the trees as a column of water filled with straws. So treat the trees that we wanna protect um, before we remove the infection source. So basically the, the trees even that are infected are gonna be pulling 
uh, upwards and translocating uh, that disease up and down throughout its vascular system. Uh, and if we are to remove that tree before treating, all of that extra water is going to be, and, 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 and nutrients and disease is going to be pushed downwards into the root system of the tree and into uh, the neighboring uh, root grafted sites. So as far as fungicidal treatments go, um, red oaks, like I said, we can only do them preventatively. This is, we, we have to keep the disease from infecting non-symptomatic trees. Um, we wanna treat anything that's a red oak that's a, an adjacent to an infection center. Um, there's no real phytotoxicities when we do these treatments. Um, and we still have to keep in mind that, you know, infection can move into these healthy trees via root grafting. White oaks, we, had, we had kind of have a two-pronged approach we can look at. Uh, you can do them preventatively at lower rates, um, which require less solution, um, or you can do them therapeutically if, you know, it's confirmed that you have an outbreak of, of oak wilt within a white oak. The rates, you know, are determined by size of the tree, the larger the tree, the more fungicide you're gonna need. Um, and you can potentially see um, some phytotoxic reactions when doing this treatment. So um, just something to keep in mind. So how long would a tree, if I were to treat trees, how, how long does it last for? Um, the pathogen oak will can live two to five years uh, in the roots of these dead trees. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that, you know, once they're dead, it's not just like, oh, it's gone. Um, we still have to keep those adjacent trees protected. Um, so for red oaks, how often we'd have to retreat um, during the second full season after that initial treatment. Um, so it's going to take three full cycles um, to make that tree, you know, really protected. So it would be, since it's during the second full season, it'd be basically every other year. So 2020, 2022, 2024 uh, would be the, the years that it would be treated. Um, with white oaks, preventatively, they may not be needed to be treated again since a therapeutic treatment is so successful. Um, you know, because it can be successful up to that 30% uh, canopy dieback. Therapeutic treatments, retreat if the symptoms are progressing. So if your tree has oak wilt, and you still are under that 30% threshold, uh, you're gonna treat annually until those symptoms uh, stop spreading within that tree. So here's a picture of what that macro infusion would look like. Uh, this is the protocol that uh, Rainbow Tree Care, our service division has been using since 2017. Um, you can basically do it right at bud break all the way up until those trees start showing signs of fall color. So you have a really large window to get some trees protected. Um, and you're gonna use a higher dose for larger trees. So just something to keep in mind uh, if you're considering this uh, as a po possible uh, avenue. Um, I would recommend you know, hiring a certified arborist to do these kinds of treatments uh, in order to, to make sure that you're getting uh, the predictable results that you're looking for. You're gonna want a trained hand uh, to, to, to be administering these treatments. So one of the most, uh, I want to say annoying, but one of the most often look to be skipped portions uh, of the oak wilt management protocol is the root grafting disruption. Um, so like I was saying, root grafting results in 90% of oak wilt transmissions. Um, so again, back to that analogy of a straw, um, if a tree is going to be pulling uh, that disease pathogen down through its root system into another trees, um, we really want to start um, severing those root grafts. Um, it's not always possible due to, you know, tough terrain accessibility um, or just other obstacles, um, but ideally uh, to stop the spread of oak wilt, we're going to want to trench at least three feet deep in clay soils and five feet deep in sandy soils. The, tren the trenches can immediately be backfilled. So once it's done, you can immediately fill it back in. Um, and typically that, that severing will last three to four years 
uh, before those roots find each other again and start fusing back together. So here's an example of a vibratory plow um, that our service division in Minnesota um, uses to, to do some root graft destruction. It's a big piece of machinery. Um, I understand that it's a lot to, to ask as far as the treatment protocol goes, um, but you know, it's a vital importance with 90% with of new infections coming through, through root graft. So here's an example of, of where uh, a trench or a root graft uh, barrier line would be, you know, kind of implemented. So we have, you know, the house and infected area. So since this is mostly a group of, of woodland people, we'll look at the woodland section out here to the right uh, of this map. Um, so you have your infection source with those red trees and the trees immediately around it, adjacent to it, were all treated with Alamo. And then we created a trench around those treated trees uh, to sever the healthy trees surrounding uh, those adjacent trees uh, from the Oakville infection site. Uh, you can also put a secondary barrier and that really helps to isolate those infected trees from the asymptomatic trees uh, that are surrounding. Next, uh, sanitation. Prompt detection and removal of infected trees is, is super important. We wanna remove uh, the bark from oak firewood uh, or seal, it, seal pile um, in black plastic for a year to kill those beetles. We don't want those beetles that uh, came in contact uh, or could come in contact with the spore mats uh, to be landing on it, even if it's, it's stacked as firewood. Um, and then taking it to an asymptomatic oak and starting a new epicenter. So we want to make sure that if it is firewood, it's it's you know stored. You know, make sure you're storing it covered uh, so that it prevents those beetles from from feeding on the spore mats. Retreatment, as far as retreatment goes, uh, we kind of went through that. Uh, the red oaks you're going to want to treat um, preventatively uh, for three full cycles. Um, every two years. Uh, the white oaks, if you know that that preventative treatment goes well, um, you may not have to treat again until you start seeing signs um, of, of oak wilt, uh, because white oaks, like we were, we've been talking about, uh, can have up to 30% dieback of their canopy. Um, lastly, uh, we're just going to want to make sure we monitor for future outbreaks. Um, make sure you're keeping a close eye on, on the oaks on your property and make sure you can implement a management protocol uh, as soon as possible. Time is everything with Oak Wilt um, and is really key, key to success. I think that's everything I have for Oak Wilt for now. Um, now would be a great time and we can and, and start taking some questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you all for your time. All right, thank you, Bob, this is great. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'll do a gallery view for us. And I guess that's just going to say, so hello. That was great. That was great information. Thank you. So we, we have questions. I know some of the stuff we've been um, answering kind of as we go. So, and there's some stuff in the chat that I definitely want to um, address. But let's start with some of the questions. So, oh, and I also want to hold on before I move forward. Um, Paul Kurtz is with us, and he agreed to uh, um, allow us to um, uh, put him on. So, if he, if anybody has any questions that are Jersey specific, um, so let me just get him so he can talk. So, give me one second. And again, like I said in the chat, if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in now. And Paul, where are you? There you are, Paul. Okay. I'm pretty sure I allowed him to talk. So, um, Paul, are you with us? I'm here. Hi, hey, how are yeah, you? Hi, Paul. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So I just have you uh, with us so you can um, actually see the questions now and all that kind of stuff. So um, Paul put in the uh, Q and A that uh, New Jersey permits are pretty much the same. As a matter of fact, New Jersey uses Penn State's 
um, uh, training program. And uh, cause I know I took the test. I actually have my, my permit. So um, we use, thank God for you guys because we use your stuff. So <laughs> Penn state, it's great. Um, so for spotted um, lantern fly. For spotted lantern fly. Yeah, that's right. We have three things going on. Okay. So um, I'm just going to read through the questions. And since they are um, sort of in uh, order, it's spotted lantern fly first, and then, you know, we'll go from there. So uh, let's see, is that true? So um, some anonymous attendee said that, uh, and I think she's talking about the um, tree of heaven, he or she, right? <laughs> that um, they thought that male trees could be clonal and send up saplings. They don't just produce seed. Again, I think we're talking tree of heaven. Yeah, um, my assumption or my understanding is that um, they may, they'll send up saplings and still produce a little bit of groves, but not to the level of uh, that females could do as far as, you know, reproducing. Um, I mean, I'm sure too, if they were, were cut, that they would start sending up saplings as well. Uh, if they're not treated with their herbicide. Okay. Okay. And um, there, there was a question down below too about, um, Sarah asked about, is removing tree of heaven a strategy option or a recommended treatment? And um, the second part of her question was, can we save tree of heaven if we have them and have all, and they are already infested? I know how I would like to answer that, but I defer to you <laughs> um, on that one, P Bob or Paul, either way. Uh, Paul, do you want to talk about it all, kind of what you guys are doing with the trap tree method? Um, well, here in New Jersey, we're not doing the trap tree as okay. much. Um, what they found, Penn State, I think it was um, somebody Walsh, and I can't think of his first, Brian Walsh, Brian Walsh did a yeah. study, and what he found out that it didn't make a difference if you remove Tree of Heaven from the landscape, they just moved to another host. So putting all that time, energy, and money into tree removal, as much as probably everybody here would love to see it gone, um, you know, it, it just isn't, you know, you're not getting the same bang for your buck as you would be, you know, using a, you know, a chemical um, application on the insects themselves. Thank I'm you. curious, um, also, Sarah, uh, your second part of the question was uh, to save, if if we can save tree of heaven, if we have them. Um, I'm just curious as to why you would want to save them, uh, being it's an invasive plant. Um, I've seen it plenty of times. Some, sometimes it's an important, you know, tree in the landscape just because of a shade factor or, shade factor. you uh -huh. know, just the way it fits in the property. Um, yeah, they can be they can be saved. Uh, you would just treat it most likely with a systemic insecticide, and uh, you'd be protected for pretty much the whole, uh, you know, adult lifespan. Wonderful. Okay, then um, anonymous attendee again <laughs> wants to know: uh, Does a rolled burlap band work? I've never heard of a rolled burlap. So again, uh, for the you know the um, tree bands. Um, for like a sticky band? Yeah, or, I'm assuming that like would a, be like a, a circle trap. Band. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I haven't tried them myself. I haven't tried burlap. Um, I know all sorts of different materials are being used to make various style traps. Okay. So I don't see why it wouldn't work. Okay. And anonymous attendee, if you have any, um, knowledge of like you've used that or you've had any you know experience we'd love to hear from you so let us know yeah um, i haven't heard anything using burlap i think the best method you know that are two methods are the uh the circle trap because it uses their own biology it also doesn't require any kind of lure or pesticide so it's it's great for the homeowner and then uh it's it's like the sticky trap. It is a sticky trap. It's called the bug barrier, and it it just eliminates the whole need of the you know having the mesh over the uh, you know the sticky part. So those are the two that you know, we encourage you know homeowners and people who want to do it in their own backyards to try. Okay, perfect. 
Uh, so I guess Kathleen Terry's question is directed towards me. So um, it'd be great if we maintained an email list for each of the, the uh, members of council, mayors, environmental commissions, shade tree chairs. It's something we would love to have and be able to keep all those um, groups in, in uh, informed, I guess. So if anybody has any suggestions, I know Anjak does a lot with that here. Um, as well as um, certainly Shade Tree Commission. So um, we work closely with a lot of them already. So hopefully we're we're doing our job in getting the word out. And certainly the Department of Ag is doing a good job here in New Jersey on getting the word out. Um, so we answered uh, John's question about spotted lanternfly circle traps. That's good. Um, Sarah, uh, we did that. Okay, so Anne. Um, this was this one. I've never heard this, Anne. <laughs> so I was told that spotted lanternfly are attracted to pine saw using a one to one ratio of pine saw to water in a bucket will attract and kill them. What are your thoughts? Boy, that would make it easy. I saw that on YouTube. I am not a YouTube, uh, Facebook. Um, I am not aware it really works. You know, we are. I, I definitely shy away from anything that's on Facebook, especially the people that tell you to use salt, alcohol, um, what was it, salt, alcohol. They made basically the strongest weed killer known to man to get rid of the spotted lanternfly, but it also destroyed all their, you know, their landscape as well. So I would stay away from Facebook and, you know, I'm going to promote us, but go to the, you know, www.bedbug.nj.gov. We have, and same with Penn State, we have science-backed information there. Yeah, great, great resource, great website. So, and we will be sending that resource management guide too um, from uh, that Bob generously offered. So that'll be included in a link that I will send to everybody that registered that includes um, a recording of tonight plus the link and then um, any other information that we can uh, come up with. I'll make sure we include it, okay? Uh, I'll also include, uh, Bob, you were mentioning, um, you know, the Plant Diagnostic Lab, Rutgers. Um, so that's another really great resource. So I'll put a link into their website as well and like what their process is for dropping off um, plant material, okay? Uh, so Kathleen, yes, you will get a copy of this presentation. <laughs> so, and this is, I love this question. I'm, I'm looking forward to the answer. So now we're, we're into oak wilt. Um, so she's planning on planting more oak trees, yay, on my property next month. Should I plant something else instead? Bob, what do you think? Uh, uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, it's challenging because there's a, there's a lot of other things too that are out there affecting oaks nowadays, like bacterial leaf scorch, for example. Um, I, I, I would do it. Um, I wouldn't be afraid of it, but um, if maybe there's something else that maybe would be an option like 1B that you wouldn't mind, you know, as a alternative, maybe go that route if it's going to be a little bit, um, less maintenance, a little bit less maintenance. Okay. Or if you still want to plant the oaks, right? Just, you have to really watch them, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and there's all sorts of different varieties out there. Um, try to find one that's maybe a little bit more resistant, go with a white oak maybe so that if it does get oak wilt, um, you know, you have a chance to be a little bit more reactionary. Yeah. That's a, that's a great suggestion. Okay. Let me pop over to the chat because I know there were some questions in there and then I we have some more in the Q&A, but uh, let's see. Um, resource guide. So Patricia wanted to know, uh, do these sprays kill bees and other pollinators? Which is a great question. Um, the first spotted lanternfly, mm -hmm. the bifenthrin, that, yes, that's a, a contact insecticide that will kill pretty much anything it comes in contact with uh, insect-wise. Um, the Dinotefuran or Transtect formulations, um, it, it does have a pollinator warning label on it. Um, the nice part is you can time it 
so that you, you do the application after blooming. Um, and then by the time the flower, the, the trees in bloom the following season, uh, the active ingredient is, is already out of the plant. Um, so yes, it is toxic to them, but they're, the way the chemical and, and active ingredient are designed, you can kind of work around flowering and uh, foraging uh, of these. Wonderful, yeah. And uh, Meredith had asked in the chat also about effective treatments that are permitted to be used in certified organic operations. And Bob, I know that you um, answered that in the chat, um, but uh, I, I just wanna pass that along to everybody. And I'm gonna butcher these words unless you wanna say it again. Um, so, uh, things like, go ahead, spinosad? Spinosad, um, that's an active ingredient that's, a, that's a, an OMRI approved. Uh, active ingredient. Um, so I don't know if that's fully considered certified organic, but um, it's about as close as we we can get. <laughs> okay. And then insecticidal soaps, hort horticultural oil is also uh, proven. It's just like you were saying in the presentation, you just have to plan on applying it a, a lot. Uh, yep. So um, hopefully that answers uh, questions there. So Tyler, this is a long one and we have, we have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna to try to get to it. So Tyler had two questions. House on at 1.8 acres, local arborist who knows his trees, uh, told me about spotted lanternfly and my black oak has a black oak, also one red oak with lightning wound under the care of an arborist and a couple red maples. And I know you mentioned red maples as being with the adults um, for spotted lanternfly. That's one of their preferred um, hosts at this point. So. Uh, she, he's only seen a couple of spotted lanternflies that flew away. Um, so any suggestions? Uh, the arborist told me to let him know if I see them. And then should he be worried about that wounded red oak and oak wilt? Um, okay, so this one's kind of multi-pronged. Yeah. <laughs> um, so taught, we'll figure out, uh, oh, black walnut, not black oak. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the the fourth in star seemed to really like the black walnut. Um, it's definitely a good tree to keep an eye on. You you know the, you're you're probably going to see them there if you're going to find them on your property. Uh, and what else we got here? The red maples will probably be your 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 hottest trees, is what we'll call them. Uh, so they'll they'll probably see the most pest pressure uh, out of all these ones that you have kind of listed out here. Um, as far as your, your wounded red oak goes, uh, I would just kind of stay status quo and just keep an eye out in, in, in your neighborhood and make sure, or in your, your wood line, make sure it's not, you're not seeing any signs of it creeping closer. Um, and yeah, treating for the insects would be great if it's, if it's stressed because of its wounding, um, you know, it could be you know, susceptible to secondary, uh, pests and borers that, uh, could kill it. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, Joanne, uh, Paul, I'm probably going to um, ask you to take this one because she went to a nursery in Kingston, New Jersey that had spotted lanternfly. And she thought that they should check stock before it left the yard, but they said no. Quarantine question. How do you want to address that, Paul? I saw that and I will talk to our nursery people tomorrow, but that is completely untrue is that you know they should be you know minding you know anything that they're selling should be free of all insects and diseases that's part of their inspection and their certificate uh the certificate uh, certification they get each year um so if you want to private message me or or rory the name that would be even make things a little bit more expedited to, to get those people on board. Um, but no, that's definitely, you know, we do not encourage that at all. Okay. And Paul, maybe it's time for me uh, from an NJNLA standpoint to actually put something out as a reminder. It's been a while. So maybe that would be good. If you, you want to work with me on that, maybe we can put something out to everybody. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So this is a good question from John. Um, do spotted lanternfly populations stay high for many years or do they fluctuate? Do we even know at this point? 
what's going to happen? Um, from what I've been told, there's no definitive data or yet on population uh, you know, fluctuations year over year. Uh, it does seem like, you know, anecdotally, just trends. Um, you'll get real bad years for maybe two, one, two, three years. Then you'll have a down year. And then the following year, you'll see them kind of spike again and start to build populations. Uh, and then it'll kind of crash again in your, that county. Um, and it's just kind of a cycle. Okay, and that's we're, interesting. We're seeing the same thing. Um, I think you're seeing mostly on that leading edge, you know, the higher populations right now as they're going through. Um, and now like areas in Hunter and County that had say thousands last year have hundreds. So we are seeing some, but there's not no rhyme or reason right now or that we're aware of. Okay. So Mia in the chat, um, asked me to please remember to tell us the water bottle trick. <laughs> so, so I think what I'll do, cause I actually videotaped me doing it. So, um, I will try to include that little five second clip. So you'll see how it works. Um, but, um, it, it's pretty cool. So I don't know if you guys have anything to say about that. I mean, it's not, it's not going to get them all, you know, but if, um, every little bit helps, I guess. Right. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Meredith in the chat. Um, so she has an orchard with many preferred hosts. I ha also have a patch of tree of heavens on the edge of the property. If I leave the tree of heaven patch, will it act as a trap tree since they prefer that to my other trees? That's kind of a cool concept. Thoughts? I mean, kind of what Paul was saying earlier, that it may not have a, a huge impact on the population. Um, I think you will kill some if you decide to treat those trees. Um, the ones in your you know, surrounding properties will probably make their way there at some point. Um, I don't know if Paul has anything else to, to maybe add on that as far as if it's gonna be an effective method or not removing the trees or treating them to create trap trees. I was, sorry, I was reading something else. Oh, uh, treating them to be trap trees. The more, I mean, you know, I guess my rule of thumb is for everyone you kill now, that's basically 50 mm -hmm. that you won't see next year. Um, you know, if you look at all the, how many eggs they lay and fecundity and all the good things like that. So, I think anything you do is going to help, um, but will it help stop them? More than likely not. It, we're just trying to get, you know, a, a where there we're we're going to be able to coexist. I don't think there's a, you know, looking at how far they're spreading. Uh, most people, I don't know if you saw that they found it out in Kansas, and now mm -hmm. Indiana has an infestation. So they are moving quickly and mostly due to us. So, um, but everything anybody can do, we, we, I strongly encourage to do it. I mean, every day I go to my office and I see him, I step on him. I know, so somebody asked about the three times that they jump. Well, usually that third time they are getting a little tired and you can get them, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that they're, they're petered out. They're just, you know, but that's the, th that's the best way to do it is the third time is the charm. Got it. Okay. That's good to know. So, um, we're going to talk Oak Wilt because Susan said, um, if there's any place in South Jersey that treats Oak Wilt, she's been trying for years to get help Rutgers, New Jersey forest service, local arborists, no one is willing or even seems interested. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts on that, we can always email Susan directly. Um, Susan, so feel free to reach out to me as well. I'd be happy to connect you with a couple of arborists who I know would you know, love to kind of meet with you and, and see how they can help. Wonderful. Do you want to put your email address in the chat? Are you okay with doing that? Yeah. Okay. So Susan, his email address will be in the chat for you. Okay. 
So um, question since we're on oaks, do oh, willow oaks suffer from oak wilt? Willow um, oaks? Let's see here. I've never seen one with one. It's a great question. I think you stumped me. Woohoo! I have no idea either. Okay. I'm going to have to find an answer on that one. Okay, we'll find out. <laughs> and um, maybe we can put that in the follow-up email if we, if we can find out. So, and Peg had a good point too, again, because of the oaks. Northern red oak is the official New Jersey state tree. That's why I, I was kind of, when somebody was saying they wanted to plant a bunch of them, I'm like, uh, you know, if you follow Doug Tallamy at all, he's, you know, that's like the best ecological tree for us. So to not be able to plant oaks is not what we want to do, so uh okay let's see i got an answer it is it is in the red oak family so it is going to be susceptible to to oak well that was quick <laughs> <laughs> you have resources bob I do. <laughs> That's great okay uh so Anne. oh ty i see paul is typing the answer regarding moving wood from one place to another within the same quarantine county so paul's answering that question and then he's going to verbally answer it so everybody can see it so yes, if it's between uh, counties, you know, we're, we're it's a fit, generally like a, Asian longhorn beetle, we have the 50 mile, you know, rule that, you know, if you're moving things, try to keep it under the 50 miles um, or if it's in within the county, but, um, you know, and, and inspect before you do it because you don't want to bring it somewhere where the county may be have it but not where that you're bringing it so um that's that's kind of you know it, it's you're never going to be able to get everything but you know we just ask everybody to do their their best to look at what they're transporting perfect okay i know it's uh it's already 8 31 so i'm just going to try to wrap up with a couple more of the questions that i as many as i can get to so um Ed wanted to know when we talk red maple, are we talking native red maple or Japanese red maple? Is there a difference there? And which one are we talking? Native red maple is, is going to be more, more common. Got it. Okay. And then uh, Lori over in the chat, uh, she was talking, we, we didn't really um, have too many questions about the beech leaf disease, which, um, so she was asking beech trees also grow in groves um, so you can treat a mother tree. Would the pesticide spread to the ba the babies, the saplings? Uh, that's a great thought. I'm not sure, to be honest, but my gut's telling me probably not. Uh, typically, because when we do an injection, we're getting it to translocate upwards, not so much downwards and in, into other trees. Um, but I guess anything's possible. I mean, well, the, I, I, I'm not, I'm not positive how that would work. I don't think so because, you know, it's the roots that are be, you know, where you're, they're going to be touching and they're not going to probably be exchanging, you know, the, the, whatever chemical you're using. Right. Got it. Uh, Lori also asked, is oak wilt the same as sudden oak death? It is not. It is a different fungus. Darn it. Okay. That's uh, Phytophthora remorum is the sub note death. Okay, uh, let's see. Da, da, da. Okay, yep, Lowe's in Phillipsburg, spotted lanternfly all over. Um, yeah, it's tough. Okay, Bob's uh, email is in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, uh, this is going to unfortunately have to be the last question because we're we're out. But obviously you can reach Bob or you can uh, email us. We'll try to get answers to anything we weren't able to answer tonight. But um, so Lori's um, had said that last year someone recommended a portable vacuum for adult spotted <laughs> lanternflies. Shh, get them butterfly nets. Scoop them a bunch. Step on them. Uh, so I don't know. I mean they're so fast. I'm not even sure you could vacuum up vacuum them up quickly, but uh, just anything that you can get to work, right. Um, is good for sure. So you can be like me in the parking lot at the shop, right. And just, 
you know, try not to get hit by a car. That's <laughs> not all we can do. And I will share that uh, the water bottle uh, trick with everybody. So we actually have Paul, right? You guys did a um, a um, circle trap, how to make one at home video, right? Well, that, that's Penn State. Penn State we have a website, um, but yeah, they, they have it. You know how to get the, the you know materials from Home Depot and make them. Uh, you can also buy them from Great Lakes IPM, um, Integrated Pest Management, mm -hmm. that they sell them in their, I don't know, 20 something dollars. Uh, and I know that, I don't know how much they have, but um, Jonathan Green also sells them locally. Fantastic. For, uh, Great resources. Okay. I think we're good. Again, if you have any other questions that we didn't get to, feel free to send them over. We'll be happy to try to answer them for you. Um, you know, thank you again, both uh, Bob and Paul. I almost put you all together there. Uh, it's late. <laughs> really appreciate all the great information. Um, appreciate the time you put in, and um, you know, um, we'll definitely do this again sometime. These problems aren't going away. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately. So. Thank you for uh, everybody that attended tonight. I hope we get to see you again next month at Backyard Forestry, and uh, we'll be announcing that uh, presentation shortly. So I hope you all have a good rest of the evening, and thanks again. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thanks again. <laughs>